Dr. Rosalie Barron is an assistant professor of pharmacy practice for Fair State University. She is responsible for the institutional introductory and advanced pharmacy practice experiences and also teaches the pharmacy law course. Dr. Barron received her Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Pharmacy from Ferris State University and completed her Master of Arts in Business Management from Central Michigan University. She has worked for the State of Michigan in a number of positions, including Pharmacy Manager and Nursing Home Licensing Officer. And prior to her employment with the state, she worked in community and hospital pharmacy. So let's welcome Dr. Rose Barron. Thank you. All right. It is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and you can pick out which one is good and bad and ugly for you as we get, go along tonight. Disclosure. I get paid to do this, and I get paid to speak elsewhere. And I also get paid as, as being a consultant. Uh, but I don't have any uh, influence over whether somebody buys anything or not. So it's pretty much more of a, uh, here's, here's the advice, take it or leave it. Oh, the other comment I need to make is the pictures are being used by permission of the photographer, who is Greg, husband. <laughs> <laughs> and the presentation is informational. It's not legal advice nor clinical advice. Uh, if you need either one of those, consult the appropriate uh, professionals. Uh, I'm not going to go over the objectives because Elizabeth did a better job than me. But starting with the rules, and these are the rules that were already in effect now for almost a year. Uh, just after I give my talk last year at this time, about three days later, they made the rules official. Uh, so those rules we've actually been dealing with now for um, an entire, almost an entire year. So these are not new. Uh, but they did change um, for interns, for pharmacy interns, uh, the number of hours, intern hours from uh, 1,000 to 1,600 hours, but they get them in the curriculum so they usually do not have to do any outside if they're attending a school in Michigan. But the thing that might be more important for you is you don't want to leave your let your licensed pharmacist license back last if you intend to ever get it back. For less than three years, it's not much of a hassle to do it. But more than three years and up to eight, you have to take the NAPLEX exam plus some other stuff. Uh, after eight, you have to take both the NAPLEX and the uh, multi-state pharmacy jurisprudence exam, which probably is a good idea if you haven't done any pharmacy in eight years, to see if you really know anything. Um, so it's probably not a bad idea. Signatures, just to reiterate, the rules did not allow rubber stamp signatures. So if you expect to get paid by a third party for a prescription, no rubber stamp on it. And last year I gave out that little uh, cheat sheet or that little table that told you what, when a signature was valid, when that's still valid today. It also deleted um, the restriction from a, from a doctor printing or handwriting a prescription on a pre-printed blank. So they gave you a prescription that's pre-printed for amoxicillin, they could certainly add the cost syrup to it. Also, it allowed them to add you know, controls and non-controls on the same blank. And just a question, do you, do you see that a lot now, again, with doctors writing controls and, you know, okay, now it's legal. <laughs> You're not violating the rule and the third party peer can't come and get you, right? <laughs> And then it deleted the requirement for the doctor to write on the prescription blank, you know, how many prescriptions were written on the blank. Okay, record keeping. Uh, probably nobody has changed their record keeping. But after three years, uh, you could make the paper, uh, make an electronic version of the paper prescription, so scanning it in, front and back, 
in keeping that for the next two years for the legal requirement of five years. Uh, I wouldn't be throwing my paper away if, it, if I was still running a pharmacy because probably one of your third-party contracts require you to keep it much longer than three years if it came in as a paper prescription. So the key here is if you have a paper prescription, you must keep that paper prescription even though you scan it in, which most systems now do, you scan in that prescription, you still have to keep that paper. You can't throw it away. Record keeping. They clarified for um, invoices. You could keep them electronically, uh, which is a good thing because once the uh, tracing track and trace thing starts to go into effect uh, with the Drug Quality and Security Act, I think we're going to see a lot more electronic uh, invoices. And it also allows for the invoice to be initialed electronically. So um, that, that was a good step to make, considering what uh, with the passage of the Drug Quality and Security Act. Oops, one slide ahead there, right? Uh, in record keeping, uh, with the original prescription, you can do uh, electronic initial now will be accepted as well as in, in the old days, and when I was an inspector, you had to hand initial that paper prescription if you had a paper prescription. The also now required to be added to the label is the drug strength and quantity and the manufacturer or supplier. For most people, this is not going to mean anything at all because we were doing that anyway. Uh, I know when I was running the Delphox Pharmacy, we had all of that on the label to begin with, but it wasn't required to be on the label. It could be, it could be on the receipt. And also, they uh, now they recognized, you know, you don't have to keep a paper copy of the receipt anymore. Nobody was doing it anyway, but uh, an electronic version. If you have all that stuff in your computer, it's like keeping a uh, receipt for the 90 days that's required. So the updated control substance scheduling last December, it's still not current. Uh, well, because the changes the feds made this year with tramadol and hydrocodone, but also um, there are a number, there was actually a couple of control substances that are already were control substances, but they didn't want to reopen the rules to add them. They are going to reopen the control substance scheduling rules. Uh, I don't know how soon that's going to happen. Uh, I was at the board meeting today, and they uh, indicated at the board meeting they're only going to open, or not open, at the February meeting, they were going to vote on technician rules and compounding rules. So the scheduling one is going to be out in the future. Now, if anybody knows about rulemaking, just because the board votes on it on, in February, it means it starts its process through the regulatory reform section, and a public hearing has to happen, has to be held. Those comments have to be reviewed. A couple other things have to happen. So probably, if we're lucky, June of next year, we might see the technician rule. They could do it as an emergency rule, but I didn't hear any talk about that today at the board. They also made bath salts, which were scheduled by emergency rule, now officially scheduled. Uh, as all of you know, all of you know that tramadol was scheduled, uh, moved to Schedule 4 by the Fed, by the DEA. Hopefully you took an inventory on August 18th of what you had or that evening before of what you had of tramadol. Or you can go fake it now, right? We do that. <laughs> um, then in October, the DEA moved uh, all the hydrocodon combination products to Schedule 2. Uh, and again, you were supposed to actually take an inventory on in October of your of your hydrocodon containing product on the, on that date or the night before. Uh, they allowed refills, but my understanding, most third parties are not paying for them. So you have to get a new patient has to get a new prescription anyway. The other um, 
couple of things that for you is now nurse practitioners and nurse midwives are highly restricted. They can no longer write hydrocodone combination products out of the office. It has to be at seven days for the patient uh, being discharged from hospital, hospice, or freestanding surgical care facility. But the PA is not effective. So the PA can write hydrocodone combination products. What about the optometrist? My first thought was I can't, but I think they can. Because 17401 in the Public Health Code has an exemption in there for hydrocodone and known combination products that they can write for. And at the time this is uh, law was written for optometrists, it was, they were Schedule 3, but now that they're Schedule 2, but the exemption still exists. So you would have to make sure they have the DEA registration as, they have to have two on their DEA registration. DEA registrations have two, two in, three, three in, four and five. And when most of them probably got their DEA registration, it was three, four and five only. So I actually wrote to the department and asked them, is, can optometrists write for hydrocodone combinations? And guess what? I didn't get an answer yet. <laughs> not, not surprisingly. But the optometrist uh, association also thinks that they can write. So but they're, I think they're looking for clarification from the department yet. Make sure. I don't think they're going to push the envelope too far yet. So if you get one, that's probably what, what they're thinking. Okay, the MAPS changes occurred around July of last year, even though it went into effect in December, were basically next day reporting or next business day reporting or daily reporting. Uh, just remember the uh, MAPS pretty close to what the patient is getting, but it's not 100% accurate because it's not the primary document. So for a patient. It gives you a good idea on what the patient has been receiving. And I would definitely use MAPS um, uh, if you have any suspicion on a patient. Uh, when I sit and listen to the board members, uh, the disciplinary subcommittee talk about it, it's almost a question they always ask, well, did they use MAPS to determine whether or not these prescriptions were, just, you know, were valid or the patient was getting same drugs from somewhere else. Pharmacy requirements. You now can uh, have internet versions or internet access to uh, your um, public health code and rules. It's probably the only one that is current. Uh, usually after every board meeting I go to the board office and ask for a copy of the paper copy for the rule book and the, and the public health code. And they've gotten so that they already have them ready for me. <laughs> they had it ready for me when I was there today. <laughs> and uh, they're both outdated. They're not, they're not current. The rule book doesn't have the official prescription, um, the um, prescription drug take back program in it. And the, the law, the public health code, doesn't have, hardly has any of the 2013 rules in it, or laws in it. So. The internet version is the most current version. In your handout, if you don't know how to get to them, I've kind of given you some clues how to get there. Until they change the website. And they do that a lot. OK, rescinded rules. Clinical thermometers are the uh, mercury thermometers, basically non-existent pharmacies. Uh, they, for a patient to get one, they have to get a prescription. They rescinded this rule that required this caution on schedule two, three, and four prescription. It's that nine font print on the, on the prescription label. Uh, but it's an FDA rule that requires you to still put it there, so it's not rescinded. Fine rule, they rescinded, but not really, because it exists in another rule in the General Bureau of Healthcare Services rule that cover all of the health professions. So it's 
still there. They can still find you. But what they did remove when they removed the rule was the limitation. The limitation it used to be five thousand dollars for a violation. And today I heard a fine of seventy-five thousand dollars mentioned at the board. Except the disciplinary subcommittee didn't accept it, and they. Um, proposed a, a different proposal, so I don't know what the fine will be in the end, but that's the highest I've seen in a long time. There's a whole set of animal euthanasia rules. Typically, these are not going to be relevant to pharmacy unless you're going to sell to an animal shelter. And you need to know what you can uh, sell and what licenses they need to have. The program for utilization of unused prescription drugs. This is this is another feel good legislation piece, just like cancer drug repository program. There's a couple more coming up that I'm going to talk about. Um, the final rules went into effect uh, this year in September. There's 12 pages of rules. I feel sorry for students who have to know those 12 pages because they're probably never going to use them uh, ever. And there's actually seven forms that go along with this program. And it's a voluntary program, thank heaven. So you don't need to be involved in it. <clears throat> the Cancer Drug Repository Program has been in existence for eight years. And there's three pharmacies that are involved with it after eight years. Again, uh, this one here, uh, the, the drug has to be in the original packaging. And it's not going to come from a patient. Uh, it's going to come from a, either a manufacturer or facility or could also come from a clinic or a physician. Um, but, or it has to be a unit dose. The cancer drug repository, the drug was actually coming from the patient back. And again, no controlled substances in this program either. OK, the feds did um, a rule so pharmacies could take back controlled substances at the pharmacy. Uh, both hospital and community pharmacies can be involved in this if they wish. This is a voluntary program. It's a good thing. Uh, pharmacies um, can become collectors. Um, basically, you have two means of doing that, and that is either a mailback program or you have a receptacle in the pharmacy that the uh, ultimate user puts their drugs into. And they can put both controlled drugs and non-controlled drugs into that container. Now, I have heard a, an assistant U.S. attorney that prosecutes health professionals, uh, I've heard read in the paper, uh, that he foresees in two years or so, he's going to have a case on this because probably going to get an unscrupulous pharmacy, pharmacist who's actually going to take drugs out of that container and reuse them. Um, so we'll see, we'll see if he's right. <laughs> I think it's not going to quite be two years. I think it's going to be a little bit longer than that, but he's probably going to be right. If you're going to do this program, be prepared to spend some money because the container has to meet certain specifications in the rule as well as the liners you put in the container. One of the things those liners have to be a certain gauge to them, as well as uh, they have to be numbered sequentially. And then two people kind of have to be around a lot with these. So when you take that liner out, two people have to be there, uh, you know, one witnessing the other. So. <clears throat> OK, I talked about the. Um, Compounding and technician rules that are coming. Uh, the board and the department are also opening up another uh, uh, other rules, uh, and that we're going to probably see rules on the pharmacist in charge um, as well. In scheduling, control substance scheduling, they are going to open up continuing education. Uh, some of the comments that I've heard about what they want to add to that is they actually want to add another law. Instead of, or not law. Math, they want to add law, patient safety. They want to add another hour of uh, 
pain management instead of the one that we have now they want to add to. Uh, looks like it's going to be very prescriptive, which I hate, I hate that because what worked for me in continuing education isn't going to work for you. Uh, and once you get that prescriptive, I think it gets uh, useless. They're also going to open up centralized prescription processing uh, so that central uh, fill and central processing, they're going to redo those. Uh, and uh, they're going to repeal the nuclear rules, which is probably a good idea. Those are about 30 years old and never been updated. Now, when they do the technician rules, so this is one you're going to see within six months, when it's going to be open for public hearing. There is an opportunity for you to add what you would like that technician to do. Because in, I'm going to talk about it here in a minute, but there are certain duties that are prescribed in the law, but the law also said other duties could be added. If you're working in a hospital, and you really want to push technician, checking technician, here's your opportunity to do it, to put it in this rule. Uh, because that's, uh, it can be done that way because the Attorney General, in one of his opinions, actually said that. That it's not in, it's not prohibited, but it's not in the law. But if you do a rule, telling the board, pharmacy, you do a rule, it could, it could be done. So here's the opportunity to do it. Or even in community, there's something in community that you really want to feel the technician could do. Here's your opportunity to do it. So those, that public hearing is going to come up. My guess is probably March. March would be probably the soonest, but March, April next year. So pay attention and comment. And I'm sure MTA is going to say, they're open for public comment. What do you? What, what would you like to see added or deleted? All right, lots of changes to the public health code. So, lots of rule changes and a lot more rule changes coming. But we had a significant number of uh, actual laws made this year that actually affect health professionals and in some very specifically for pharmacists. A few of those are pilot projects, dispensing with a prescription and having no patient-physician relationship. We're always taught that we had to have a patient-physician relationship. Well, there's a couple of circumstances now where you don't need a patient-physician relationship and you can actually fill a prescription. The pharmacist in charge, compounding, pharmacy tech. Um, then I would talk about some other public acts and then the Federal uh, Drug Quality and Security Act. Pharmacist in charge is not an act by itself. It's stuck in the middle of the compounding. So Public Act 280 is where you find the pharmacist in charge. It's just kind of like a, a section or two that's stuck in there that talks about that, but the rest of it talks about compounding. So pilot projects. This has been in effect since uh, March of this year. I haven't been able to find anything on the website that indicates anybody has, has uh, submitted one. You can do, uh, the law allows 10 pilot projects. It doesn't say 10 per year, per month, 10. So I think when 10 go, they're done. Uh, you have to pay a fee to get your pilot project through. And uh, you could have a rule suspended while you're working on your pilot project. And the typical time period, uh, or the maximum time period is 18 months, and they can renew it for another 18 months. So what, what's a pilot project? For, for example, if I wanted to uh, do a pilot on having the technician initial a controlled substance invoice instead of the pharmacist, I can ask for that particular part of that rule to be suspended while I did up my pilot project to show that the technician can even do that better than the pharmacist. So, but that would be a, an example of, of a pilot project. You can't suspend a law, but you can 
they can suspend a rule. Okay, patient-physician relationship is not needed to dispense to a school board auto-injectable epinephrine. How many of you have seen the prescriptions of the school board? Probably nobody, because I found out that um, the maker of EpiPens actually gives it free to schools. I think they were doing it before it was even legal, but I guess I won't complain. The other one is the opioid antagonist naloxone. Uh, you can uh, dispense to other than the patient. So uh, if I've got a little problem with uh, using cocaine on the side, and Greg says, Greg's my husband. Uh, I think I better get a naloxone strip uh, just in case we're all you know, because he hasn't got my life insurance paid up yet. <laughs> so he could actually go get a prescription and use it on me, but it would be in his name. Or in this case, the park ranger could have, have a prescription for uh, naloxone. And don't take a nap in the park because they might just think you've been doing something else. There is a bill in, in as the legislature still in session, to expand the auto-injectable epinephrine to uh, more than just the school boards, to expand it to restaurants, camps, and just about anybody who thinks they need uh, to have auto-injectable epinephrine on hand. And I'm, I'm guessing that's going to pass, but I haven't. I didn't go look today because uh, they still are meeting tomorrow, so I'm, I wasn't going to waste my time on, on it today. Over-the-counter tax relief bill uh, as of um, March, we legally now cannot have to pay the tax on those prescriptions we dispensed as over-the-counter, or dispensed as prescription drugs, but really we're over-the-counter there. Okay, pharmaceutical grade cannabis. This was uh, signed by the governor on like the very end of last year, December 30th. And you've heard absolutely nothing about it, right? Because the bill, the whole act, public act, does not go into effect, or this, or this not the, I shouldn't say the whole, but this Article 8, which talks about pharmaceutical grade cannabis, does not go into effect unless the DEA reschedules marijuana. And that may happen in a few years, but right now until that goes into effect, and once it does, then actually pharmacists could dispense marijuana. It sets up a whole system for people to, to, to grow it and the wholesalers and pharmacies sell. So think of what a cash business that would be, right? So maybe we ought to petition the DEA again, right? But the Medical Marijuana Act is still here. Uh, about one in 100 people in Michigan have a medical marijuana card. So one of us has a card. It went down from last year. Uh, uh, it's about 1%. Last year was about 1.3% of the population had uh, a medical marijuana card. And the most often uh, reason that they are issuing the medical marijuana card is for uh, severe and chronic. Okay, the MAC transparency bill is still sitting there. This is probably one of the very few bills that did not get immediate effect. So this bill does not go into effect until next year sometime, and we still don't know when because the legislature is still meeting. So it, the clock starts ticking 90 days after they end their session here uh, this year. It's probably not very helpful to most uh, um, third party payers. This is, was a very watered down that transparency bill, but it was a start. Okay, Public Acts 95, 96, 97, and 98 were a package. I don't care what side of the fence you are on, but right to life moves this whole package. 
and it really will impact you. Um, for one, the conflict of interest disclosure is actually um, more so for the board. Uh, in fact, that came uh, to light today. The disciplinary subcommittee was meeting. Disciplinary subcommittee consists of three professional members and two public members. One public member was absent today, so we had three professional members and one public member, which means they still could vote because we had one public member there because they have a super vote. They always have to vote with the majority if they want anything to pass. Um, action came up against a uh, um, drug chain, a pharmacy. All three professional members recluse themselves. So they had to table the action because they couldn't do anything with it because they only had one one member to decide anything and it was on a forum. So it was it was very enlightening today. Um, these acts will allow investigations of violations by health professionals more than four years old. This concerns me a little bit, especially with pharmacists, because somebody could complain um, that Rose made a mistake on a, on a prescription back in 2007 when I was still in a pharmacy, you know, community pharmacy. Those records are gone. It's seven years later. And what was the only required to keep them five years anyway, uh, legally? My third-party payers probably required it longer, but go after the company, it doesn't exist. So I, I don't, you know, how can you defend yourself? So that's, that's my concern here from the licensees part, is how do you defend yourself? They re completely got rid of community service as an option that the disciplinary subcommittee could impose on a licensee as an action. And uh, now the department can actually set aside a disciplinary subcommittee's action or a board's action if they feel it doesn't serve, uh, protect the public, and impose their own action. And I guess it will happen in the dark, because I don't know how that's going to happen to know what, what's going to happen. But, but the department can actually set aside a disciplinary subcommittee action on a licensee if they feel that it doesn't protect the public and impose their own action on the licensee. The licensee, can, the only option at that point is to go to court. Not circuit court, uh, appellate court, I think it is. But this is the worst part of these of four bills. It's the two strikes in your house. <clears throat> and you notice the word uh, shell is in this uh, bill, this is a quotation right out of the bill. Shell means I have to do it. It's not a may. It's a shall do it. So you can lose your license for six months. So what, what would be an example of this? The pharmacist in charge. As the pharmacist, I'm the pharmacist in charge of, let's say, three pharmacies. My one pharmacy A allowed a technician, allowed a person to work as a technician who wasn't a licensed technician. That's who they're going to go after, pharmacist in charge. So I'm going to be charged with that. Same thing happens at pharmacy B. I get charged again for the same type of thing. Within two years, the board now has to take away my license. Attorney friends of mine tell me that probably the first time that happens is going to go to court because it's, oh, it's an overreaching um, action by the legislature. Because it doesn't matter how minimal the um, action was. So if I put the wrong doctor's name on a on a label, and somebody complains about it, oh, I can be disciplined. And I've seen people disciplined for that. And if it happens again, so there's no harm, no foul, basically, you still can be disciplined for it, and then I'll lose my license for six months. That was the bad part of that, um, those four. OK, pharmacist in charge.
all pharmacies in Michigan and all pharmacies that are licensed in Michigan, no matter where they are in the United States, have to have a Michigan licensed pharmacist as the pharmacist in charge. For the last two months, the state has not issued an out-of-state pharmacy license. Before that, every month there would be more issued out-of-state than in-state. But since October 1 or September 30, when this law went into effect, they haven't issued an out-of-state pharmacy license. And I think it's because the pharmacists in charge, they don't have a pharmacist in charge that has a license in Michigan. It takes a little while to go through the process. Just ask Greg back there. <laughs> uh, so we'll see. But So every pharmacy in Michigan, so if you didn't get a, a thing from the state asking you for a pharmacist in charge, think back when you signed up for pharmacy, signed the pharmacy license, whose name you stuck on there. It's probably it's going to be considered the pharmacist in charge for right now. So if that's you, <laughs> you want to get your name off of there quick. <laughs> And you have to make you know do that change within 30 days <laughs> of a change of a pick. Okay, because the pharmacist in charge is responsible for that pharmacy along with the pharmacy for what goes on in that pharmacy. So I, I probably can see a case coming along now where where I see in, where there, um, there was a case in, on today's list of. The, uh, sanctions by the board where they were just charging a pharmacy and not a pharmacist. Next year, it's going to be they'll know who to charge because that pharmacist in charge is going to be charged along with the pharmacy. Or maybe only the pharmacist in charge, depending on what they decide to do. And you're responsible, you know, to maintain appropriate records and show compliance if the, if the uh, board asks. Uh, if you do the change of the pick, you have to notify within 30 days. And basically that pick is supervising the practice of pharmacy for all the locations that they're the pick for. And you can be the pick for more than one pharmacy, but you have to work eight hours on average a week in that pharmacy. Uh, so that is a little restrictive. And it's, uh, uh, I know some people have already contacted legislatures about making that a little more liberal because that's, uh, particularly when you get into the UP, sometimes things get a little spicy up there about being able to do that. Okay, compounding laws. We have both a federal law and a state law. I don't think anybody read the federal law when they wrote the state law. The federal law was actually signed into law by President Obama prior to the state law being introduced, even before it was introduced uh, in, the, in the Michigan legislature. It was already in, uh, signed by, the, by President Obama. The big thing here to remember is that the state law is very liberal, but the federal law is the stricter law. You want to go read the Drug Quality and Security Act, and particularly the uh, 503A part of that, because that's going to override most of what the uh, state law is saying. So the state law can add, add some stricter stuff, in, and they do that from time to time. And as you know, this is why we, we have those compounding laws, is because of the Lumen Compounding Center and the 19 deaths that actually occurred in Michigan. <coughs> and uh, 64 deaths uh, nationwide. And I thought I heard on the radio yesterday that only they've only been able to attribute 38 deaths to the, um, what's that big jam recall for? Oh, the ignition. You know, the key in the ignition. They've only been able to attribute 38 deaths to that. And all the plus, all the publicity that got and the public here of congressional hearings I got. And the money that's in that, I guess GM's got a lot more money than moving on compounding center, but it just kind of surprised me, but such as such. 
Okay, the Drug Quality and Security Act has two parts. Basically, the first, Title I talks about Compounding Quality Act, and Title II is the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, or that track and trace. Uh, I could spend a whole talk on that. <laughs> and I'm not going to talk hardly at all about it, other than to say stuff is starting to come out with on it, some guidances and draft guidances by the FDA. So uh, you might want to start paying attention. Some stuff becomes effective this January. So the Compounding Quality Act part basically talks about traditional pharmacy compounding it and then adding that 503B part, the outsourcing facility in the uh, federal law. So basically what the feds look at it as, if you're compounding, there's basically three ways that you can compound legally, and that's you're going to do it as a traditional pharmacy or you'll be an outsourced, a registered FDA outsourcing facility or if you can't meet any of those two requirements, then you have to be a manufacturer. So this voluntary thing about, the thing about voluntary, uh, being registered voluntarily as an outsourcing facility, is you're volunteering to register as that as opposed to becoming a manufacturer. So it's this, or a traditional compounder. There's no, you know, operating as an outsourcing facility uh, and then voluntarily decide whether you want to register or not. That's not, that's not what that means, as I've heard some people say. So traditional compounding, you can do that, and you don't have to meet good manufacturing practices, and you don't have to get um, approval for your new drug or abbreviated new drug, and you don't have to meet the labeling requirements. So you don't have to have a package insert to go with your drug. Uh, if you meet all the other requirements in the Act, and primarily that is, you're, you have a prescription each time you're doing, you know, for the compound that you're doing. The compounding per prescription. You're a state licensed pharmacy, and, it, and that's what it says in the Fed, uh, Federal Act, uh, and you have to be in compliance with USP chapters. That's what the Fed says. In compliance with USP chapters. Uh, and then there are restrictions on drug substances used and minimal out-of-state out distribution. The feds are still working on the memorandum of understanding if you're going to fill prescriptions out-of-state on what that should look like. Okay, register as an outsourcing facility with the FDA. Um, the feds don't require you to be licensed as a pharmacy to be an outsourcing facility, but Michigan does. So if you're going to use an outsourcing facility to buy products from, particularly products that are on a uh, shortage list that's being put out by the FDA, you have to uh, also make sure that they are licensed by, not only are they FDA registered, and you can find that in the on the FDA website because they list all of those that have applied. Then you can also go to the state website and make sure that they have a pharmacy license. They will be inspected by the FDA. The outsourcing facilities will be. Their inspection, their 483 inspection report, is on the website. And if they issue them a warning letter, the outsourcing facility a warning letter, it's on the website. So a lot of information is out there on the FDA website for outsourcing. And they can compound sterile drugs, but they have to be uh, in compliance with current good manufacturing practices. So traditional pharmacies are going to follow USP. Outsourcing has to follow current good manufacturing practices, which is a step up from USP standards. So they can compound large quantities of drugs that are on the FDA shortage list. Um, these are all going to be on the website. They're not there yet because the feds are still working on parts of the uh, of the Drug Quality and Security Act. Outsourcing facilities have to report what they compound to the FDA, adverse events uh, also, and they have to pay a fee. The fee is at least fifteen thousand uh, dollars, and then when they be reinspected, they pay again. So. Uh, because the FDA pretty much has to operate on uh, fee-based uh, schedule. 
they are subject to, to labeling information. So in the Federal Act for an outsourcing facility, there are things that they have to have on their label. And one of them is that states something to the effect this is a compounded drug. So that everybody knows up front that this is compounded uh, and not a manufactured drug. So some of the challenges is, especially from the state level, the, the state requires uh, sterile compounders by September 30 of next year to show compliance or be accredited, show compliance with USP or be accredited by an accrediting agency. And there's only one, and the board approved it this morning, and it's this PCAB accreditation is what they approved this morning. Uh, accrediting agency to accredit sterile compound and pharmacy. Now, the board has not come out with what, what they are going to mean by show compliance with USP standards. So a lot of information is still unknown in how the department is going to interpret stuff uh, and put it out there. Because I've heard a lot of talk about, well, a joint commission, once a joint commission comes in and inspects me, then I'm accredited. Doesn't work that way. Because is the lab accredited, the lab that you run in the hospital accredited by the Joint Commission? No. The x ray guys, the nuclear guys, no. I don't think so. Same goes for a pharmacy. The other thing is entities with multiple sites of doing sterile compounding for all facilities um, may actually, and I'll pick on sterile here. So if the main sterile lancing facility is going to be the main sterile compound in for a number of their out, outlying hospitals, they would actually have to be registered with the FDA to make an outsourcing facility, according to the Joint Quality Security Act and the information that the FDA has put on their website. They would consider that outsourcing in their um, <coughs> as an outsourcing facility uh, in their mind. Now the state wouldn't, but So this is what is not um, allowed by federal law. In the State Compounding Act, it says you can apply and actually compound stuff without having a prescription and sell it or move it to another licensee. The feds are saying no. Under federal law, if you're a traditional compounding pharmacy, not an outsourcing facility, but a traditional compounding pharmacy. You have to have a prescription compound. So this this part should not have been written in there because it's very confusing because it's in violation of federal law. So it's or not violation of much more lenient than the federal law. The federal law doesn't allow. It. In which, which is very funny, because if you go read the application, they actually have the application up for this. It says, you require compliance with 21 U.S.C. 353A in the application. You know what 353A is? It's 503A, the traditional compounding pharmacy in the Federal Act, where it says you have to have a prescription to compound. So, doesn't know, you know, you can compound without a prescription, but no, you can't because you have to have a prescription. Whether you're an outsourcing facility or a out, or traditional compounder, you can't compound drugs that have been withdrawn from the market. The FDA is updating this list. It's, you know, it's kind of old, but pretty much any drug that's been withdrawn from the market because of safety or efficacy, you can't make it. Like, you can't go and make Vioxx and and fill a prescription with it. You can't compound exact duplicates on a regular basis. If you're taking out a dye, if somebody has an allergy to the dye and there's no other way to get that product to the patient, that's another thing. But you can't make an exact copy. And then you can't compound demonstra uh, any drug that's on the demonstrably difficult list, which hasn't been developed yet. <laughs> Lots of things coming. 
Also stuck in Public Act 280 is the requirement for pharmacies to notify in 30 days if a complaint's been filed by another state, not a final action, which is already a requirement, but just if they file a complaint and you haven't gotten to a final action. If you're under investigation by the Fed or uh, investigation into compounding accreditation standards. So if you're accredited and the accreditation, that accreditation entity is coming in to investigate you, you're going to have to notify the state. Pharmacy technicians. This becomes effective December 22nd. So theoretically, on December 22nd, your technicians have to be licensed. But guess what? The state of Michigan will not have the application available until December 22nd. It's going to happen like that. So um, I'm, I'm waiting to see if it'll actually, if the state site will actually crash on December 22nd. Because every technician is going to be going to the state website to, to print off the uh, technician uh, application. So there's three types of licensure for technicians. A full, a limited, and a temporary. A full is um, where they have to pass the certification exam uh, listed in the act, uh, one of those two. And do all the other stuff, you know, have to be 18, high school graduate or GED, do a, they all have to do a criminal background check, just like every other health professional. So it's going to cost them a little money to get licensed because of the criminal background check. They're going to add probably double what they would pay for their um, technician fee. So the full license is without restriction then. The temporary one is if somebody is waiting to take the exam and it's issued for a maximum of 280 days. So they're in the process of getting their technician licensure, or their full licensure. Now the limited one is what a lot of people like to call grandfathered, but it's not, there's really no grandfathering of technicians here. The limited license is that technician uh, has to be uh, working as a technician on the effective date, December 22nd and have worked for 1,000 hours in the prior two years uh, to that. A limited license is restricted to that location, that pharmacy. That physical location is, I think, what they say in the uh, frequently asked questions. Because there's frequently asked questions out there on both the technician uh, law and the compounding law on the state website. It's a third or fourth version. I know when you go look, it looks really nice. But it is a third or fourth version, because I've got copies of all the others. <laughs> Trying to figure out what they were changing. OK, so there are defined functions in the Public Act in 17739. There's a list of functions that if anybody does these, other than a pharmacist or a pharmacy intern, they have to be licensed as a technician. Um, <coughs> It adds a technician to the Board of Pharmacy. So one right now, one of the public members spot is vacant. They're waiting. Probably next year they're going to appoint a technician to that uh, spot. They will have to do 20 hours of CE to renew their license. It'll be a two-year license, just like a uh, pharmacist. And the maintenance of uh, technician certification is not a requirement for licensure. So right now, certified technicians uh, maintain their certification by doing their CE and paying whatever fees they have to pay. That certification process is not necessary once to, once to maintain their license. So they actually could drop off that certification stuff and do the license. So, but because it was not written into the law. Some states have written it into the law, into their laws. So these are the functions that if a person, other than a pharmacy intern or a pharmacist is performing at a pharmacy, um, you have to, they have to be licensed as a technician to do. There's still a lot of clarification that needs to be uh, <clears throat> done with these. Because that first one, assisting and dispensing. When the clerk sells, does the money at the cash register, is that assisting and dispensing? So 
pay attention when the technician built uh, technician rules come up because we we need clarification on that. Uh, they've been very. Uh, <coughs> they haven't shared anything as far as I, I can get on what they're, they're thinking here. So all of these are these are the requirements. Um, that are written in, those are kind of, I just abbreviated those, but I, I think I have the long ones in your handout. So there are challenges with the technician bill, and it's a very short time frame. So within 90 days, the department has had to do a lot of things, and one of the things I noticed that they have done is they have updated their uh, licensee search. Uh, you can actually search for a licensee now. I can go to the state website, and I can pull up every pharmacist in Ingham County, or, or Lansing, or Houghton, Michigan, take, take your pick, or physician, or dentist, or whatever, whatever health licensee there is. They've really updated that, and they had to do that to catch the compounding thing. Because you can actually do pharmacy, and then another drop down actually asks for all the compounding pharmacies. Uh, and I did that the other day, and there was none yet waiting. Okay. Here's another CE for you. This bill, uh, this is a public act, and it mandates that uh, I think colleges that are training health professionals will have to have training in human trafficking, and then also when licensees are renewing, they're going to have to have training in human trafficking. So <laughs> you were sleeping and they were busy. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't see that uh, Bill Shooty ad on human trafficking in the election? This is it right here. You didn't know you were going to have to do uh, CE on it, right? OK, here's another feel good legislation, the Right to Try Act. So I have whatever kind of disease, and I've tried everything in the world that, that has been uh, out for it, and nothing works. It gives me the right to try a drug that's past phase one, phase one studies, OK? For those of you who have forgotten how many people that is, that's about 80. 80 people have taken this drug and didn't die. Uh, but the problem is with this is that the federal government's rules, the FDA rules on this are very, very strict. There's a number of things that have to be met for you to be able to try a drug that's not been approved by the FDA. Uh, and basically, it has to be, um, you have to get it in a clinical study, a compassionate use, and there's one more. You have to meet one of those three. The drug company's got to be willing to either give it to you or sell it to you. Uh, and the insurance company doesn't have to pay for any of it or any of the treatments surrounding it. So uh, I don't know how much of this is really going to happen. I know we hear about one case or two where people complain they can't get a drug, and here it is, right? All right. So we talked about the rule changes from last year. There's a lot more coming um, this coming year in 2015. Uh, probably 2015, I'll just be talking about nothing but rules. And then the new laws that have passed this year, uh, including the pharmacist in charge, technician, uh, naloxone, epinephrine. So what may I clear up for you? I know you, you'll want the answer to the questions first, right? <laughs> All right, so answer to number one would be C, right? Internet versions are allowed. What about number two? I think you can do a naloxone. It is C, and it's 
But the naloxone can be written for an individual, not for a person. And the person is an individual as well as any other entity. Right, right. So by definition, an individual has to be a human being, but a person, which you would think would have to be a human being, it can be a human being, but it could be a corporation, it could be a school board, it could be any other entity. So right, a school board could, um, you know, have naloxone on hand, hopefully they won't need it. I mean, shouldn't even have to think about it, but. So it would be E, C and D. Okay, three. E, e all of them, right. Four. C, yep. Five. A, yep. Six. See, you were paying attention. <laughs> All right, now the fun part, right? Questions? All right, Jim. The uh, compounding issue is a little murky sometimes for hospitals. How far you take it? Because oftentimes we will make up specialty types of things. They get to give pediatric if you get something making it all back on the special those sorts of things. Um, those are probably all okay as long as don't call it a pre-made form. But are you still allowed to pass on something that is available already in a solution? Do so you want to make a solution of something that is manufacturer available but for cost reasons or just infrequent use? Do you want to Compound that. My understanding that there's some language in there that's available prepaid. Available prepaid. See, in the federal law, we're stating or making an exact duplicate of the commercially available product. How far does one take exact duplicate? Would you compound something to do concentration? Is that? That I don't know. Okay. And uh, the, um, the feds are going to probably rely on the instruction as to what. Um, it's probably something you're never going to find out about if it's just in your hospital. But uh, like doing a compound is going to be telling them in their environment. So they can do that. And this whole thing, too, in response to a prescription is you can also you know, kind of or order. Or you want to take it. I mean, most of the times you're going to be making these types of things up. Are going to fall. Right, and you can, right. you can so make. It's not like every patient are you making this. No, you can make up uh, compounded products ahead of time. If you so normally, you right, you normally get, you know, I normally get 30 prescriptions for this ointment or this solution every week. Yes, you can make up your week supply ahead of time. So it's written in the federal law that way. You can take one from the Yep. Okay. We can take the first question. We're going back and forth here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for those prescriptions that have both control and non-control substances, do they get filled under a controlled substance? Files. Files. Oh, files. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's why I would put them. <laughs> I would always, I, you know, I would always default to the stricter uh, of regulation. But. Uh, for third-party purposes, if you need to find that prescription, though, that paper prescription, you might want to make a note to yourself, you know, in the other file or the original of that one is. Yeah. But if, if you have a better solution? No, no, no. <laughs> because that's, it's with third-party auditors primarily where you're going to get into issues with the control and non-controls because they're going to want that original paper. And if you can't find it, then they're just going to say it's not valid and take the money back. So, okay. Is there a way that a, that a pharmacist can check to see if they are deemed as the PIC at any particular pharmacy? For instance, if you're employed by AFME Pharmacy and mm -hmm. you leave their employee, is there a way you can determine that they removed you as the PIC so 
that you're not uh, told the bad two and a half years later if there's an incident. And they still have you listed as part of the charge. We hadn't worked there in two and a half years. Thanks. We have any any there's a Yes, it's, probably, it's not an easy way to find out that I know of right now, but there would be a way to find out. But if you know you are the pharmacist in charge and you're leaving that place, I would not leave it up to the pharmacy or the owner or whoever to tell the board that you're no longer the pharmacist in charge. Write the letter yourself saying, I am no longer the pharmacist in charge effective such and such date of such and such pharmacy. So that you, you know, you have proof that you've done it. Yep. Yeah, I wouldn't leave it up to uh, somebody else to do it if you are the pharmacist in charge because yeah, theoretically they could control. Well, at least they would, what, if nothing else they're going to charge you with is not notifying the board. If, uh, one not so. Okay. A recent inspection made us verify all fax prescriptions that have electronic signatures. How do you tell the difference between a fax prescription, real or electronic signature, and the difference between a prescription fax from a computer that doesn't require verification? Is there an easy way to tell it? I could never tell it uh, when I worked. Is there an easier way today? Oh. Well, it's across the board. It's supposed to, there's supposed to be some indication that it's an electronic signature, but PCS, the company that runs a lot of the electronic health records that our, our clients use, don't have a solution. Or there's, there's been uh, modifications made to some software programs that take that statement out. So when it does, you just have to verify verbally and then treat it as a verbal prescription. It's a mask. Okay. That's the best answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, back there in the corner? Actually, I was going to say that you can contact the board and uh, through an email what the company brings the board and find out if you're still the PIC. Oh, they will tell you? Oh, okay, and who, who did who did you contact? Do you know? Uh, I have to check the email. Or have to find out. Okay, uh, and then I can pass it on to Elizabeth if, uh, and then she can pass it on to the. Okay, or you can just send it to her, or you know, send it. To, I, I want to know because I'm sure I'm going to get that <laughs> question again too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. So they're asking. Did you say that you can now remove the patient address from the prescription label to make room for other pertinent information as long as the patient address is on the receipt? Uh, I, didn't, I don't think I said that. But. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now. You, you, <laughs> what is the address? I don't think the address is on the label. That's a trick question. <laughs> Whatever is required in uh, the Board of Pharmacy rules for labeling on a prescription is what must be on the label. And I don't know what's off the top of my head today. Okay. Probably next month when I start teaching that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Another question here? Yes, yes. Yeah, another the question that you've got with me. Um, <laughs> getting, getting back to what the health system setting and this whole uh, definition of assisting in the defense of health. Mm -hmm. And how far is that taken? Because oftentimes in pharmacy, you have sort of handoff points where maybe non pharmacy people touch a med in a certain way that could maybe be interpreted as assisting. Quick example. Um, we use business anesthesia devices in our surgery area. As they're pulled to the pharmacy by text that barcode scan and the only process pharmacists check it with a barcode scanning which is planned that meant to fix this anesthesia or it was meant to brought to anesthesia by pharmacy personnel, but then that last step is 
done by an anesthesia technician, which is not necessarily a pharmacy tech, that then scans those meds and restocks the device. So is that considered a dispensing process or is it just an industry method? Um they'll know by that, but I don't think it's going to be a, I haven't seen anything where it's going to be published publicly that, uh, you know, Rose's Pharmacy takes back control substances. At least I would hope not because I might get more than I would bargain for uh, in that process. But, right. but yeah, I'm not aware of a, a list going to be published either. Okay. Yes. So pharmacy Right, they're internal. They need to become internal. So they, there may be a pharmacy student and they're not getting it. They would have to be competent. Well, they're, they're, uh, they're a Ferris student. student. They're an intern when they walk through the walk in the door as a free farm. As a free farm? Not as a free farm, no. And I don't think they can get a I, don't, I have to go back and look at that about getting an interest license for you. I think you have to be enrolled in a school to get an interest license. So yeah, then they may have to be. Right, and that's another problem with the bill. There's, there's a lot of problems with the technician bills. If you think about it, you've even having a high school student, a lot of uh, pharmacies use high school students even in a, uh, as part of their high school in pharmacy. And they can't do those things unless they're a licensed technician. So yeah, yes. So that, you know, right to your legislature. I can't change. <laughs> I can somehow lean on the rule a little bit. But let me I'm just take another one off there. Okay. Um, if the law requires a physician-patient relationship for prescription to be legal, then is a prescription written by a physician for himself legal? What about for a family member? Okay, All right, that's required, right. So, a physician writing for themselves is highly frowned upon. There's nothing in the law that says they can't, but depending on what that, it's really going to depend a lot upon the professional judgment of the pharmacist, okay? Uh, the, the physician should, have a record of every patient, including themselves or the family member. So, and I, in probably all of you have seen this, where a physician has come in out of town, and I need the amoxicillin for my kid, I need the eye drop, uh, and yeah, we've all done it. You know, I've done it because uh, it wasn't. It's not against the law, but it's a profession. Your professional judgment and. You know, if you get the, the doctor coming in every week getting morphine from you, <laughs> you ought to start asking a few questions. I have one here first. Well, you won't be able to apply online. No, I don't think any health professional can apply online. 
You have to right. I think you can fill it out and then print it out. Copy. Right. So I would maintain a copy that I started a process or whatever I needed to do. Because they also have to submit the stuff to get uh, fingerprinted for um, criminal background check. But it's going to take them probably a couple months actually to get licensed. Because you have to do the criminal background check and that's kind of run through the whatever the state police do that for that and then have to back to the department. Right. I, you know, if I was still running a pharmacy, I would just have them do it right away. And as long as they're in process, I'm still going to use them as a technician. How am I going to operate my business? So, yep. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, the handout states mixing of two or more drugs is compounding two. So mixing one drug with a base ingredient to create a cream is not compounding. Is the cream a drug? Right, so that, what's a cream, right? <laughs> cream could be a drug. So yeah, if you're, uh, it's probably going to be compounding. Starting this with limited license technician, mm -hmm. if you get a, a technician who intends to apply for the limited pharmacy license, but works Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Pharmacy A in Grand Ledge, Tuesday and Thursday, and pharmacy in Mason, can they still do that? Or do they have to pick one pharmacy, one F, one DEA number, and that's the only store they could ever work in forever and ever? <laughs> Go, uh, have you read the uh, technician uh, frequently asked question on the website? I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Yeah. it there's one question that talks about that, and it specifically states that physical location. So that physical location, to me, means one store. And in, in the law, I think it says one, uh, location. one location. Yeah, it's very, it's very specific. So right, so the way I look at it is. That technician will have to pick in one of those stores, and that's where they're going to be for the rest of their life until they get fully licensed. That's an incentive to really get them. Right. Because right, because I've had people ask me why I could get them, they could get two licenses, yeah. one for each store. Right. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Because <laughs> you can't get two licenses for anything else, you know. Right. Anybody here got two pharmacists licenses? <laughs> Yes, Several people have had this question and it's stated that when you submit your license, you put down multiple addresses at the same time. And that means it's supposed to be going to In other words, if So there's going to be a spot on the license application to put more than one address? That's where it has that's where where it's gotta be. I'm not sure that you So what we're gonna have to wait. I think so much of this is open yet to interpretation and that what, what's the application going to look like? So, right, that might be the solution is they may allow it with uh, the traditional Right, right. So that that could be that would be great. I sure. let's keep our fingers crossed. Right? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. You want to keep going? I, I'm okay. You're okay. I'm okay if everybody else is okay. 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 Um, can a pharmacy hire an unlicensed technician with the intention of training the technician and the technician would apply for a temporary license and be required to obtain a full license within 210 days? I, I think so. I have, I have to go back and reread that, but I, I don't, I, I think that that could be done. So you could hire somebody. It depends upon whether uh, in the uh, temporary license there's anything written about actually being in a formal program of some sort. And that's what I would, you know, if there's nothing in there that says they have to be in a formal program or a formal training program approved by the board, then uh, they could do the, the temporary and then move on to the full with uh, full certification, getting certificate, passing the certification test and doing the rest of it. 
But yeah, they would, would need to read that um, sections I don't know if they would consider that an investigation. I think about the law says investigation, so if an audit is an investigation. I'd probably report it and just mess up their work. <laughs> Better to do and not to do it. Because there was a case on the board agenda today that had a pharmacist who didn't report they were convicted of a felony. And this was a felony happened like a couple of years ago, and I'm thinking, how come the board didn't catch that in the reporting process by the courts? But evidently, they're way behind too. So, because um, no, felony conviction means you immediately lose your license with summary suspension, and then they work out what the details are going to be. Okay, with the expected date of the Tech Act changing to June 30th, 2015, can a newly hired technician wait to apply for a limited license until they have a thousand hours of working as a technician before June 30th, 2015? Is it going to change? <laughs> Okay, I haven't followed every single law since a um, couple of months, so... Uh, Rose, that, that, that June 30th thing is an inspector will not be reviewing whether or not you are licensed until June 30th. It doesn't mean... So it's going to be an enforcement uh, discretion. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So, right, I haven't, I haven't seen anything official about that yet. I've got something. Oh, that they're going to... There's a, apparently an addendum being uh, reviewed by whoever reviews them. It's pretty close to being sure that it's going to go through. Okay, so it's going to be an enforcement discretion until June 30th. That's what I think. Uh, then I don't know the answer to that because I got to see what, how that's written. Okay. Yep. Oh, here? Okay. We'll go on to the next one. Okay. Um, okay, well that's a bunch of small <laughs> On December 23rd, my technician quit. Who can I hire? <laughs> oh, I never thought of it. Hopefully they have more than one technician. Well, they, they could probably hire somebody. Uh, <laughs> Right? You get a limited license and uh, work up to the, yeah, you know, they'll get in line with everybody else on the website, uh, in line with the application. How many, how many licenses do you think we have here? We have 10,000 pharmacists. I think we've probably got at least three to one, right? Four to one? I'm probably thinking probably 30,000, 40,000. That's a lot of applications to get through. Uh, wow, I don't know how soon they're going to do that. <laughs> they might need longer than June 30th, maybe okay. December 30th? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, you can get your marijuana card sooner than you get your tech license. <laughs> they have timelines. <laughs> well, let's do one more Okay. it's 8.30. Okay, so the hospital pharmacy needs to be licensed as a compounding pharmacy if all products are used in-house. Zero compounding. Zero compounding. Uh, that one I don't know right off. I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. Okay. Yeah, so. Way too many laws that are running around. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. I can right. imagine. Okay. Oh, well, somebody else has figured that out. No. 
Okay. Um, okay, well then let's do the next one. If pharmacy technician certification is not needed for relicensure, relicensure, will the designation of certified pharmacy technicians be replaced by licensed pharmacy technician? Perhaps. Um, the possibility. Possibility, right. I don't know what the official abbreviation is going to be uh, by the state. I don't think I've seen anything in the oral pharmacy technician, whether it's just going to be T. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be TT because that's a physical therapist, so it's got to be something else. Okay. So, right. No, I haven't seen anything on okay. what the abbreviation would be. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, um, the questions that we didn't get to tonight, which I think is only... Well, the... You want to do the next criminal one? background check, that'll, that'll be actually, that'll be in the application itself because they, it's exactly, they tell you exactly who you have to use to do the criminal background check. So, the students, or not the students, but the young graduates here know, know that all very well, right? Specific, or specific agency, they have to use a specific process, and it's all spelled out in the application. And the application is not available yet, so it's going to be there. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. Okay. So. Did we get through all? I think. Let me look here. I think okay. I can have that uh, one for multiple. There's no such thing as a predated prescription. It's either dated on the date it was written or it's not legal. Uh, okay. But they can write still on uh, a certain. Yes, do not fill until date, right. They can do a do not fill until date, but they must date it on the date to write it. They can't date it tomorrow, write it today, or date it yesterday. Like I do my checks, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> a week um, later, <laughs> I'll write it today. Okay, well the last question is, does naloxone still require, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but right. Does it require a valid prescription, and also is it just the injector form or tablets included too? It still requires a prescription written by a prescriber. So it has to be a valid prescription, but it doesn't have to have a patient-physician relationship. So it can be written to a school or a uh, jail. jail, whatever. Right. Uh, and I think it only includes the injection form. I don't. I don't think it's And I, it doesn't. It doesn't say the epinephrine bill says auto or or it has to be the injector. No, but the naloxone one does not say state that it has to be the injector. So it could be just the um, the vial. Because I think the injector is like six hundred dollars or something. It's outrageous. Uh, and I think they just raised the price on it too. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. All right. Okay, wonderful. Well, that's all, right. all the questions that we got. So, I'm just going to do a couple of. So, stay tuned. It's not over yet. <laughs> okay, so. There we go. Okay, so um, obviously, we all have post tests and evaluations that need to be completed. So for those that are on the webinar with us, um, as soon as I wrap this up, I'll run upstairs and send the link and you guys can take the post test and evaluation. Um, and then of course both are necessary for to meet your CE requirements. Everybody here um, have your post test and evaluations completed and we'll collect those before you leave. And if we have any additional questions from tonight's program, um, you can contact me and there's my information. And I can always get them over to Rose. And um, hopefully everybody enjoyed tonight's program. Thank you so much for presenting for us tonight, Rose. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.